Welcome, everyone. Hi. How are you guys going? All right. How's, how's the whole book group experience been going for you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really great for me as well, which um, I guess that's what happens when you step into your passions. Um, there's lots of things coming up for me every week as well and realising how I interact with all of you and um, just going deeper into the material myself for my own progress. So it's, it's really beautiful. How do you all feel about last week's discussion? We got, to, got into some meaty stuff, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, I had an email from Elvira, who's in Victoria, who's been following along, and she just watched the last discussion. And she wrote me an email this morning that I thought was, it was really beautiful, and I thought um, I'd share it with you before we get into chapter three. Hi, guys. All right. So she says, Hi, Mary, another timely discussion. I feel it's huge what's going on in book group. I thought I was in fear. Again, I've skipped over wanting to feel how angry I am. I'm making it so hard for myself. Up until recently, the truth has been an entirely intellectual process, and I have practiced it through my anger on you and AJ. It starts from what is most familiar to me, being hard on myself, blaming myself first and then others. I've had a lot of trouble differentiating between the law of compensation and blame. I've been using the truth to give myself more of the punishment I feel I deserve. The discussion has made me go further into something I started a little while ago. I started to really hear the endless barrage of blaming myself, catching and stopping myself, but it made me all confused because I didn't know what to replace it with. Now I see maybe I can have some compassion for me. I'm really surprised how confronted I am by that. For some time, all around me, people have been saying I'm too hard on myself, and I arrogantly dismiss them all, thinking, what do they know? They don't know what's inside of me. They are feeding mine and their addictions. When I feel compassion for myself, I can see there are sparks of love in me. Not wanting to see that has fueled my feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, and I'm scared to hope. If I recognise that there is something to work on within me, I have to face all the anger and fear. I didn't see this one coming. So saying thank you doesn't seem like enough, but it's all I can do right now. I love Elvira. I felt that what she expressed is really powerful um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I guess, firstly, it was very emotional for me reading that because my huge desire um, for, for the book group, I suppose, is that we might start to bring these teachings um, from our head to our hearts um, because I know that's a struggle for me. That's the process I'm in as well. Um, but that's where the power really kicks in <laughs> when it's in our hearts. Before we do that, as we discussed last week, when it's just in our heads, we can change the terminology we use in our everyday life, but we can end up projecting unloving things at each other all the time and repeating the same old injuries, just calling it something different. Um, so when we make this transition from it coming from our head to our heart, I just feel that is so beautiful. Um, and I suppose that's when the the real power of love comes into our life. When we do that, when the teaching is in our hearts, then we recognise that not only if we're going to be loving to other people, that we're going to be humble and feel everything, but we're also going to recognise that we can receive love. And um, what Elvira is uh, expressing there was just so beautiful for me. I know Elvira personally from our travels, and I know that she struggles a lot with feeling hard in herself, and um, feeling hard on herself, and at times it does make her hard with the people around her. So for her to feel like she can have some compassion for herself um, was very moving for me, and also um, 
moving in that that's what I'm beginning to feel for myself as well. And, and when I forget it, I feel how hard I get with myself. And when I remember it, it's just so beautiful. So I wanted to acknowledge her for her courage again to share with you all. Um, sometimes I feel like these outliers say more of the meaty stuff than, than we say in this room with each other. So I'd encourage you to, to open up more if you feel that's something that you want to do. Um, but also acknowledge Elvira. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise with you guys just before we start, I just need to have a drink just a second. Was about just some of the personal reflections I had after last week. So this book group is very much about the book and about you guys for me. It's all about you getting the most out of this experience. But for me, obviously, I'm going through stuff and I'm reflecting on things after every group. And um, I don't feel the need to share all of that with you guys because that's just about me and my growth. But there are some things that I feel are really um, relevant or they might help you as well in your progress. And I'm also aware that if I'm going to be a good teacher, I'm going to be a very good learner. <laughs> and so um, that's why I really take the time to reflect after each group and also about how loving I've been with you guys and or how much I've served you and how I could serve you better. So last week, do you remember, was everyone here last week? Is there anyone who wasn't? No, just a few weren't here last week. So last week we had a, we had a lot of discussion about what it means to love each other, um, what repentance is really about, but also sort of, I suppose, a culture within the group of being, of using the terminology of the law of attraction or you've just got to feel your feelings to actually be quite harsh on each other. So we talked about what does love in action really look like. And Alex raised a really good point. Does anyone remember what the point was that Alex raised? Tara? Um that um, we're all representatives of um, these teachings and, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so he and was how saying... We, yeah, how we are um, acting and it, not just within our group but within the, in the community of King Roy and surrounding areas is really important. Yeah, he, he was highlighting an issue of love that if we say we believe in a thing... Uh, we do represent that thing then to the people around us. And um, when, we, when we say we believe it, it's um, understood that we reflect what is being taught. And very often in this community, um, I've heard many examples told back to me from members of the community where people haven't, um, haven't done that. Mm. Um, so there's two things. I want to talk about that point specifically, but before that I want to talk about what happened between Alex and myself. Um, so, because um, for Alex, he's had some issues in the past with spirit influence and feeling quite angry or attacking with myself and AJ, um, when he raises his hand, there's a feeling that rises in me of fear. Um, oh, what, what's going to happen? And because sometimes the spirits are still hanging around Alex, but also it's because... I have, unre I have not resolved issues of the past and I project them onto the future. And so when he raises his hand, there's fear. Alex was quite connected last week and he said a very beautiful point. And I took a while to get around to really going, I'm with you 100% on that, Alex, because there's, there's two things going on for me. One is a fear of like, oh my gosh, hang on, um, I cannot teach an untruth. So I need to be like really, really feel that this is a truth. Um, and second is about the, the history between Alex and myself. So I went home and I really felt about that in terms of an issue of love, of how I'm treating my brother, because um, I'm using the past and I'm projecting it onto him in the future. And I had the opportunity to see Alex a few days ago and apologise to him about that, because obviously that's a very unloving thing that happened um, for, between us, from me. Um, but the reason I raise it with you is this, is that so many of us are using what happened in our past, in our childhood, 
the pain and hurt that occurred then and we're projecting it onto the people in our life now. We're, proje we're projecting our mum stuff onto the women around us. We're projecting our, our dad stuff onto the men around us. If we're afraid of our dad, we get afraid of men. If we've, you know, felt competitive with mum, we feel, or mum was competitive with us, then we feel all women are going to be competitive. All these things. It's a theme that happens in our life. And um, so I wanted to raise it to show you that's, that was it in action. <laughs> But it, it, I observe it happening with all of us all of the time. So it's just something to be aware of. And the power of our... Un, not only the power of our unhealed um, emotions and what that does to the relationships around us, but the power that this unhealed emotion has if I do not self-reflect, if I do not take responsibility for what's ha what my interaction with different people. So... Um, yeah, that was just a little bit of my reflection on the last week uh, that I thought you might gain from. And thank you, Alex, for the amazing point. <laughs> and thank you for... I asked Alex if it would be OK if I talked about that publicly. Um, so thanks for letting me do that. Um, and on to his point, which is an awesome point. <laughs> I've heard quite a few things um, happening in the local community where people are actually literally saying that they're upholding the truth when they're, when they're actually being very unloving. Our massage therapist told us that someone came to her place of business where she works and her daughter was in the waiting room and someone who was saying that they were following these teachings told her that her daughter needed to leave because her daughter was angry and had a lot of angry spirits with her and this was the client's time and uh, told... A, my friend, uh, in no uncertain terms, that her daughter should go because it was her massage time. Um, now, can you see that that is a huge twisting? She, in a very this whoever this person was, in a very unloving state, entered somebody else's place of business. They had the free will to go there or not. They then said that they could um, preach or uh, direct at a person about their own daughter. Um, they did not acknowledge their own law of attraction in this situation and they did not acknowledge that this person is in their own home, basically, and they have no um, authority to tell anyone to come or go. The only thing they can do is use their will, if they have an issue, to leave. Otherwise, the whole interaction is completely out of harmony with love. And that's just one example of many, many that kind of come back to me um, and this is why I guess my first point I feel is so crucial. This is how we can use the so-called teachings, the words um, from our head in order to harm other people. Whereas when they're in our heart, we would never do that. We would own our own situation. We would never want to impact on the will of someone else. We would never be uh, bossy or hypocritical with other people because we've been looking at ourselves first. So... Yeah, I thought um, while it's completely up to you guys what you do, um, as it is up to me, you know, as I said last week, there's many things where I feel I haven't been reflecting the principles and I now feel that's a really serious issue for myself. Um, but the way that you interact with the community definitely has an impact on, on how these teachings are viewed. So, Mon? Um, I really agree with you, Mary. Alex and I were speaking about this um, beforehand and um, well, a few weeks ago when I started a job in the community yep. and I feel that there's so much responsibility. I'm almost too afraid to act because, because I don't want to project. Like, if, if I feel anger coming from someone like, like a boss, like in the past... Like I've said, you're being angry now or I haven't owned my emotions and I know there's been like people that have come to, to the place and have been really unloving and they see they see this path and Jesus followers as unloving people. Yeah. So I feel like there's or almost, I'm almost like set back, like having to right wrongs and I've, I feel yeah. really afraid about, about that and I guess I just don't trust myself in... In speaking the truth, because because I feel so much pressure, like the responsibility. Yeah, and that's Mon. I feel like you don't need to feel like, 
oh my gosh, I have to, you know, you don't have to get into a sense of fear and responsibility. You just have to be yourself and be humble to what's coming out of you, first and foremost, you know. Another thing that I hear a lot of is about um, people imposing their emotions upon the people around them, the community around them. Yeah. Um, the feeling that, oh, I'm on the divine love path, that means I feel my emotions. So if I'm in the middle of my workplace or a rehearsal or whatever, I'll just have my emotion right here and now. Now that's a very, actually a very unloving imposition on the people around you. When you really want to feel your emotions for yourself, you go and feel your emotions for yourself. You don't need to do it in a public place. And if you are, there's something else going on. There's a desire to either make other people involved, and sometimes, Mon, you do have that feeling of wanting other people to be involved in your emotions, or a feeling of wanting to punish people and show them what they've done to you, and, and, or just wanting to show off that I'm different and I feel my emotions. And none of those things are actually in harmony with love. So I feel, Bon, when you're interacting with the community, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on speaking truth, I'd focus on living truth, yeah. which is about having a condition of love inside of me. And that condition of love at times will lead me to speak the truth. But it, when I come from a place of love, when my intention is a loving one, I will never be trying to prevent a situation by saying the truth, like, you're being angry at me, go away. Um, which is sometimes what we do when we say we're speaking the truth. So I'll be owning my own emotions in that situation. I'll be, you know, owning what's going on for me and desiring to love this person and, and love myself. So sometimes that might mean saying, actually, the way you're treating me, that's not okay with me. This is not a space of love with me. You're not loving me or you're not respecting me or whatever that is. And then you need to make decisions based on your will about that because you can't impose change on the people around you. You can only change yourself and decide whether you want to be in the company of certain people or not. Yeah. 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 Because, because in, the, in the beginning I would try and prevent any unloving behaviour by, by exactly by doing... saying, yeah. And now there's just so much fear of... of um, being around that behaviour, that I just, I'm mean, just accepting it without doing what you're saying of, of taking the loving action. But I, I feel like I have to get to that place of actually desiring to be loving yeah. to myself and walk away without, like, from a place of love rather than from a place of fear. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Which means is going to mean feeling some of your fears. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mon, for bringing that up. Uh, if we go to Tara and then to Barbara. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been living in Kingaroo for seven years now, and um, so I know quite a few, few people. But it's just been interesting to, for me to observe that um, most of the people that I've known for those seven years either... I, they've just sort of dropped away from mm -hmm. my life without me and I've not preached to any of them. In fact, most of the past friends probably don't even know that I'm yep. involved unless they saw me on the television. Yep. Um, and it's just been... It's just, I just sort of have discovered that. I mean, there could be other reasons why <laughs> they're not interacting with me anymore, but it was of nothing that I have done yep. um, consciously or, yep. you know, I've just... Um, so I don't know whether that... That just naturally changes, you know. They just literally. I've not. Co no one. I've really. Um, you know, was hanging out with seven years ago. I'm. It yeah. was really in my life now. But I feel the law of attraction is always at work, isn't it? So yeah. as your soul shifts, then the people we attract shift as well. And yeah. um, I. I wouldn't. Are you worried about it, Tara? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not worried. Just, I was just. You know, it's just that. How just how things have subtly changed, and yeah. when I was looking back a couple of years ago and going, or not even maybe 12 months ago, and going, Wow, I don't hear from this person, this person, or this person anymore, and I don't actually have a desire really to connect yeah. unless I bump into them and I talk to them. Yeah, but even that doesn't happen either. So, yeah, just you know, wonder what's going on there. Maybe as I'm growing that little bit, um, just those things just change, like things that don't sort of serve you anymore just fall away. Yeah, so like. I feel people are drawn into our life through desire and through unhealed emotion. So um, when, we have a, when we're connected with our desire and our personality, very often we attract people into our life who 
mirror that. They have a similar feeling and they're drawn to that. Yeah. And at the same time, there's other things acting, which are the unhealed emotions in our soul, which attract people into our life in order to for us to work through things. And usually it's they have something also an error within them that that interaction has the potential to heal it's up to them whether it does or not yeah. and as it is up to us but so I feel like it's really common especially as you grow for people to sort of leave your life and new ones to come in because those two things if you're acting more in your desire and if you're healing different things it's your whole attractions will change yeah, yeah. and yeah. desires have um, changed you know like um, seven years ago it was all about um, birthing and natural parenting and, you know, yeah. bringing those women together and, and um, yeah, and just as I see the truth more, um, I'm not attached to that and I see the errors and I see, yeah, so that's, desires have changed. Yeah, 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 yeah. awesome. Okay, Barbara? Um, that point you made, Mary, regarding um, self-reflection mm -hmm. uh, just is so important. Um, and I had a situation a few months back with um, um, Moni in our group and she came to me one day and says, look, Barbara, I I'm sorry I haven't been in contact with you. I'd really like to connect with you and sit and chat and blah, blah, blah. But because I have a huge injury with not trusting my sisters... I totally shut down and, and Moni actually said, oh, well, I'm not connecting with you now, so there's something going on, so I'll catch you later. Yep. And be, taking the past to the future, as you were saying, I instantly judged Moni by saying, oh, Moni must be spirit-influenced mm -hmm. and laughed about it, just mm -hmm. internally. Mm -hmm. And then a few hours later I had a self-reflection on that and I realised hey, it wasn't Moni there. Moni was actually in truth. She couldn't feel me because mm. I actually shut myself down because I didn't trust her. I yeah. didn't trust what she was saying because I have an issue with not trusting my sisters. Yeah. So at that moment, I wasn't being honest with Moni. She was actually being honest with me. Yeah. And that thinking about it later on, that self-reflection, made me hugely aware of that, where I hadn't been before. Yeah. And I have done it many, many times in my life. Yeah. Many, many times. And yeah. now I can see yeah. how I've done it. Yeah. Yeah, self-reflection is pretty important, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's start on chapter three finally, hey? <laughs> okay, who loved this chapter? Me, yeah, yeah. No, oh, sorry, people who weren't here last week, we didn't even get to chapter three last week. We just discussed, yeah, yeah. I did put it on the blog, so... Um, all, the, all the late changes end up there, so... Um, Next week we're going to, or yeah, next week we're on to chapter four. But this week we, last week we talked about repentance, which was a strong theme in the chapter. But there's lots, of, lots of other stuff in there. Uh, who needed a dictionary for this chapter? Yeah, a fair few. Does anyone want to run through a few of the words they had to look up and their meanings? Kate. Um, so just go through the word and the meaning? Yeah, if you um, know where it came from in the... Yeah, I've got yep. the page numbers, yep. prosaic on page 20. Yep, so he says that he was cold, dull, unimpassioned, prosaic, um, phlegmatic, phlegmatic, that's how I say that, even stupid would have been, have been considered appropriate epi epithet. <laughs> Epithets by many. Actually, there was three words in that. <laughs> three bit, words in the one sentence. You just read, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what does prosaic mean, Kate? Um, prosaic was lacking in poetic beauty. So, synonyms would be unimaginative, plain, ordinary. Yeah. And what does phle phlegmatic? Phlegmatic, not easily excited. Synonym, mm -hmm. apathetic. Yeah. And epi epithets or epithets or whatever. Yeah. Um, a descriptive word or phrase to add to the name. So the example that was in the dictionary that I looked at was like Alexander the Great, where the great would be uh, like the, the kind of add-on to his The title adjective, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. a way to describe the character. Yeah. yeah. So this is at the start of the chapter where Fred's just saying, look, I'm not an enthusiast at all. Um, and I kind of chuckled at that because I think that he's just a very modest character who's just apt to put himself down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. What did you feel, Kate? 
Um, oh, I had a question. I felt yeah. unsure about it, actually. Like, yep. I was just... One of the questions I wrote down... I know you talked a bit about this last week, but I just wrote about the change of character that he ponders about early in the chapter, where he went from being unimpassioned to very questioning and inspired. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I was just trying to reflect on what that, why that was, like whether it was to do with um, that, that there was like this facade of apathy almost because of the society that he was in and then that facade was lifted when he passed and mm-hmm. that his true nature was able to come out or um, whether it was just because the, the conditions that he was in after he passed were a lot better than in his earthly life mm-hmm. that freed him up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wasn't really yeah. sure what... So why. let's... Let's talk about that a little bit because Anna in Sweden actually listed that as a truth. She said, and I can feel her emotion, she's very hopeful about this. She said, a change is happening to us during the pass through the mist. It's more than leaving the body and the transformation in appearance to our soul. Frederick is changing from not being inquisitive to being that in a higher degree. So it's something that I wanted to talk about. That's not actually what's happening for Fred. I feel it is actually because in his situation in Earth, there was no love there. You know, he was very much on the outer of society. He had actually displayed quite a bit of inquisitiveness, if you think about it, because he'd looked at the Bible and he'd, dis- he'd discerned for himself what he felt the truth was in the Bible. So he'd definitely been a truth seeker and he had lived by this principle, even though he totally got ostracised by everyone for doing it. Um, of this principle of love that he discerned from the Bible. So I feel, as I said earlier, he's being modest. But I do feel there's a change, and that is because the way it feels like to me is, like, if you sat a toddler in the middle of an empty room, the toddler would crawl around a bit and have a look, maybe play with the light switch or, you know, and then go, okay, this is a fairly boring room. (laughs) But if you put a toddler in a room with, like, a gazillion toys and these fun, loving people to, to hang out with, the toddler would be like, yes, let's, what are we doing next? Well, oh, wow. And then they played with me and then they, I learnt this. And, then, and that's how I feel Fred is as he enters the spirit world. It's like a total, total change in his environment. And these parts of his nature that got quite, you know, suppressed and didn't have any outlet on earth suddenly have an outlet and he's... Wow, into it. Yeah, yeah. Joy? Does that answer your question well, Kate? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I thought the same. I thought it was just that it was more interesting to him than the usual discussions on earth. And also something that he mentioned in one of the earlier chapters that that he felt judged in those situations and doesn't feel judged... Yes. In the spirit world. Exactly. Yeah. So he was, he was very judged on earth for every endeavour he took into truth. It was, you know, he was told he was going to hell in how many different ways. Uh, whereas in this situation, he can feel the love that's coming from the people. And this is something I love about Fred's total nature is that he feels people, doesn't he? And he, he trusts that. And so he enters the spirit world and he... He can genuinely feel the people he's interacting with rather than just listening to their thoughts. He says, I think it was in one of the earlier chapters, he could feel the love with which the message was delivered and that made him trust. I think it was when they said, you've got nothing to fear and he could feel them and he said, okay, all right, nothing to fear. Whereas on earth, he, this feeling nature of his felt the judgment and the ridicule and so he didn't have much outlet for his inquisitiveness. Um, something that Anna brought up, Anna in Sweden, was the fact that she feels like she needs to be more inquisitive, you know, and that's something that we've been talking about a lot, isn't it, how much this part of Fred's nature has served him, even on earth, enough to... He did discover some of God's truth on earth, but then as soon as he hits the spirit world, wow, he wants to know. And, um, you know, if we all had that same attitude to our relationship with God, we'd be getting to God really quickly, wouldn't we? If we just, instead of this state of fear and mistrust, oh, I've got it, AJ said that, I need to just, what's the hidden me? You know, you know, if we just went, oh, okay, I could test that as a theory. I'm going to try that. What does that mean? And come back and again and again, you can see the difference in the way we can progress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you have Joy again? Um. Yeah, it made me write a note to myself, actually, that a little bit of knowledge doesn't mean I know everything. 
And what you're just reminding me of then is um, often I'll hear a truth and think, oh, that's it. And yeah. think that's the whole package. Yeah. Whereas um, to be more inquisitive is really to yeah. seek the whole truth. Yeah. And see that there's so much more. And isn't the theme of this chapter actually a lot about the fact that um, people on earth think they've found the truth and that limits them entirely uh, in their life on earth. But as they hit the spirit world, it also limits them. So um, there's big lessons about the growth and development of the soul. I love that in this book that we're told so many times in so many different ways that it's a journey and there's more to learn. And that is the nature of God, isn't it? There's this infinite. So there's always more we're going to be able to learn and ways we can develop. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, Jason over here. Yeah. And then to Samantha. Oh, I just a question, but I had a feeling that as you go through the mess, does the soul damage that's done to you or passed on from your parents, does, does that get alleviated through the mess? Like, because um, I felt that some of the attributes that uh, he was getting or was because some things were by God uh, because of the removed. soul damage was yeah. removed. No, I don't feel that the soul damage is removed from us as we pass through the mist. I think we in Chapter 4, we might it does talk a little bit about this as well. And so it would be good to talk more about it next week as well. But I feel it's more just what we said, that the conditions changed. And a part of him that he had kept kind of um, suppressed suddenly had an outlet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if we go to Sam... Um, yeah, it was just about um, how we were talking about Afra's view of himself and yeah. I felt that a lot of what he kind of felt about himself came from other people and other people's projections. Yes, I agree. And Samantha. their judgment yeah. of him because yeah. I just remember reading that and just feeling a bit of an emotion come up about my experience of that as a child and how... You just get sort of pigeonholed, like yep. she's got this type of personality, she's this type of person, when there's this feeling inside of, no, that's not who I am. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. But he he doesn't actually seem to have very much of an emotion about that, does he? Like No, not that he's expressing in the, right now. Um, I feel just his excitement, hey, that he's just in this experience. But um, yeah. And he seems very... Um, down to earth about, look, this is how I was regarded. And I think that's possibly because on earth he had to grieve a lot about how he was regarded. So he's already passed through a lot of this emotion. You know, he's had to deal with... The reason I feel um, that he's quite a free kind of a person and, and AJ was talking with me about this as well, is that he's actually had to go through a lot of things that a lot of us are still in a lot of fear about. That is like being judged by society, um, st like standing up for a truth that we believe in, even if no one around us does, and living our life according to that truth, even while we're getting ridiculed. So I think that he's actually grieved a lot while he's on earth about this being separate from society, you know. So that's why when he gets to the spirit world, it's like, oh, this is great, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have that stored up in him, yeah. yeah. Which if you think about applying that to our life, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? If we think about the power we could have in our own life if we did get on and grieve these things. We could live a life that we really feel has integrity. But also, when love does come and when new opportunities do come, we can just go for them because we've already grieved all this. How does everyone else feel about this feeling? Yeah. 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 Thank you. No worries. Uh, if we go Geraldine and then Diana. Uh, Mary, I've had the same sort of um, question myself um, about how he um, doesn't seem to have been upset about having been judged a, a lot. I mean, it's a huge issue for me, um, so that's why I wonder that. And um, so if he did process it, do you think he cried about it? Yeah, I think quite likely, yeah. Yeah throughout his life, you know, in order to face the different things that he did. Yeah, but I think your question is a bit interesting. Yeah. What's the feeling behind the question? Um, I, I've just um, pondered on that myself. I've, 
yeah, I, I guess, you know, it's a huge issue for me, the fact that I was so severely judged as a, as a child and, um, uh, and, and I have a, just a, a huge um, uh, fear of judgment and uh, yeah. of, of not being seen for who I am and consequently... And there's this feeling about, I don't want to have to cry about this. Okay. Yeah, I've, I feel – what I feel as you're talking about it, Geraldine, as well, is this thing like when we're a kid and something happens to us, um, we can cry about it and it kind of becomes – we grieve and then we have the opportunity to learn about ourselves more and move on with our life and understand, okay, that person isn't going to accept me how I am. And I think for Fred, from a very young age, he didn't have a mum and his dad was quite in opposition to him. And so I feel like even as a child, he was starting to come to terms with some his, how his nature was not accepted in his family. Now, for many of us, we were prevented from crying because of other things in our environment. So we never got to grieve this feeling that I'm judged, the real person I am is judged and we didn't get to grieve it we didn't get to even fully understand it we just entered this other addictive thing now of oh, if I change myself then I get then I get praise and 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 then we grow into adulthood and it's like a backlog stored up in us isn't it yeah. and it's painful yeah. and then we're still living in it we're still living it with the people around us. We're still living in, oh, I really want them to like me and do you think they hate me? Oh, you know, and I can't possibly do that because how will it be viewed? And that's all stuff that, you know, that internal thing that's going on. So we're still living in it. And the sad truth is that while we're still living in it, not only are we dragging that stuff from the past with us, it feels really heavy, but we're also kind of creating more and more backlog like there'll be more grief because I missed this opportunity and more grief because I didn't follow my heart then because I wanted everyone to like me more you know and I feel that sometimes that's why when we hit these points we go oh I can't possibly grieve this and I don't think that Fred did <laughs> you know he seems to be like an English gentleman did he really cry and I feel that's probably because when we have parents who are like totally uninvested in us there is more sense of self. Now, I didn't have a childhood like that, but I know some people did. Sometimes it's a very sad and lonely self, but um, there is more of a sense of separation. So when I grew up, it was very, I was very enmeshed, you'd probably call it, with the whole family dynamic, and my whole sense of self came from them and theirs from me and all that sort of thing. And so... That very often in those situations, our emotions get really dampened down. And then when we get to adulthood, there is a big backlog and there is going to be a lot of tears to cry. So I feel that perhaps some of your grief right now is about the fact that not only do you feel like you've been judged and rejected, but there's a huge backlog inside of you. Yeah, yeah there's a huge backlog. Yeah. I feel that I have started to um, make some headway into that. That's good. But yeah. there's a massive backlog. Yeah. And that's what causes yeah. the agony that I go through. Yeah. yeah. And you know what else I'm learning is that it's like a point. There is a point where we can decide not only to start to grieve the backlog and the original herd, but we can decide, I don't want to create more of this in my life. And that means changing the way I live my life. Because for a long time, I just tried to kind of grieve a bit of backlog but I wasn't willing to have the courage to change the way I live my life and that is just be myself right now and feel how everyone feels about that and sometimes that brings more grief <laughs> um, like my whole family is totally rejecting me right now and I haven't wanted to feel that I've, I've kind of got it and grieved a little bit but I, you know if I decide I'm going to live my life completely differently now which is totally not invested in how they view me then I'm going to feel the backlog is going to be with me, but also I'm not going to create more backlog, is what I'm trying to say. So I guess what I'm trying to inspire in you is the fact that you can make a change now, which means that this big, heavy backlog that you're feeling doesn't get any bigger. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Thank Thanks you. for sharing, Jeremy. Yeah. Okay, Diana. Um, I feel like Fred cried a lot in his aloneness as a child and I feel yeah. he was um, he was just totally blamed by his siblings and his father for the death of his mother. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just, yeah, I feel, yeah, that was just very present with yeah. him. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I connected with quite a lot of grief just with that first page. Mm -hmm. And um, it's around um, my fear of, like, asking questions. Yeah. And, um, and how... Um, yeah, wrong I felt made of as a child for my inquisitiveness. Yeah. And for just wanting to know or wanting anything. Yeah. Who else yeah. can relate to that? Because that's a big one for me too. Yeah. And I've really started to experiment with just letting that side of me out. Um, uh, AJ gave a presentation a little while ago about electricity and I was like... I was really interested, he's a great presenter anyway, but I was like, every five minutes, I've got a question, I've got a question, I've got a question. And I found myself halfway through going, shut up, Mary. Oh my gosh, you know, this is wrong. Like all of the childhood feel that, feelings that I must have felt, as a like I'm being annoying, I'm being a brat, I'm being self-centred. And, and I'd have to go inside and go, no, no, I just, I do just want to know, you know, and then I'd push myself to challenge it again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, so. I was talking to my mum about it this morning yep. and um, and I was also wanting to say to her um, that I'm, I really want to take responsibility for what a nasty sort of child I was as a teenager mm -hmm. and, and as becoming an adult, like just wanting to punish her back yep. and I really want to, you know, like own that now. Um, but she said to me, like, she said... Have you remembered how, how when you were a little, uh, you know, like a, a baby, really, mm -hmm. but, um, how you didn't want to be here? And and I uh, said, well, that wasn't really, that wasn't my emotion. That was actually yeah. your projected emotion at me. But it just made me start to feel more about how, yeah, why I feel so alone inside. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. I want to, guys, just uh, last week a little bit and then again today, it's just creeping in a little bit, this idea of sharing our stories. Uh, we need to be careful of that. Sometimes if you... Like, sometimes I feel it's great if we're reflecting on the chapter and we go, oh, this is how it is in... Like, I can see that in my life. But when we get into feeling like the need to... There's been a few stories creeping in. Um, if you feel the feeling in the group, how does it feel when someone goes right into their story? Yeah, it feels like taking. So we just need to... Like, I feel it's different if we're relating to Fred and we're seeing that, how that relates to our life. But very often we don't need to get into the story about it. Um, that's more about us and less about, you know, our learning and being a part of the group. So if we can just watch that, yeah. OK. All right, Kate, do you have more words for us? Yeah. Or did you have another question about this point? Or um, Just wait for the mic if you... Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a bit about what Sam was sharing. I'm not sure if you want to go back to that or just move on about the, his personality, his perceptions. Of yeah, maybe if we move on, right, I think. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, the next one was that I had was page 26, orthodoxy. Where is it? So, are you in a book, Kate, or in a printout? Yeah, in a yep. book, and it was something about um, that he didn't live a life of orthodoxy. I think. Oh, yeah. So he is saying um, yeah, this is a sort of shock to me, but I'm not even an orthodox person. I was no friend of orthodoxy. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the second paragraph in the in the book version. Yeah. 
Perhaps so, but I'm unable to see how it would be possible for them to form an accurate conception of this life. It is so different from what I expected to find it, and I was no friend of orthodoxy. So what, what was the definition? Um, that was generally accepted theory, doctrine or practice. Yeah. So he's saying, I can't, I can't understand how they're ever going to understand it because I wasn't even a conventional person and it's shocking to me. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. Do you want to move on? Yeah, Any the next, other ones? The next one was sort of um, on the same page, a bit further down, halfway through the next paragraph where... It, he was just. Ta- it was. I was just kind of curious. He, he was using this um, metaphor about the butt of a daisy doesn't expand into a rose, mm-hmm. and he also said the one about you never find the blossom of the slow to be the, the progenitor progeny. of a peach. And yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know much what that meant. I understood the daisy rose one, but yeah, then I just looked up that word slow, which was the fruit of the black thorn which is sharp and sour in taste, so like the contrast with the peach, the uh-huh. sweetness of the peach, yeah. Yep, awesome. That's great because I didn't know what a slow was either. <laughs> but he's saying, so you never find the blossom of this dark, sour fruit to um, actually be the, be the father or the owner or the creator of a peach, is what he's saying in that sentence. So that, is that clear to everyone? Yep. Okay. Um, do you want me to move on to yeah. the, the next one that I was looking at was on page 28, which was anathematized. <laughs> anathematized. Where is that on the page? Paragraph three. Paragraph three. Oh, can someone give me a sentence? Uh, Ah, thank you. And all testimonies of earth bear evidence to the fact. But seeing a ministry like this would be fatal to all creeds and sects, as it would break down the profession of the priest. It has therefore been anathematized anathematized (laughs) and pronounced to be of hell. Okay, great sentence. What does it mean, Kate? Uh, That was cursed and condemned. Yeah. So it's been judged, condemned and pronounced to be of hell. So does everyone understand what's meant there in that paragraph? Yep. Okay. Any more? There was a similar word to that same word on page 29 as well. Libel, when he was talking about... It's about halfway... In the book, it's about halfway down in the third paragraph. Mm-hmm. He was saying... I can't find it. Do you want me to just read a bit? Yep, yep. In this life, every man Uh. is held responsible for his own deliberate acts and motives, but all consequent punishment is remedial, not vindictive. The noblest gift with which he is endowed is the power to reason. This being so, he is expected to consult and use it in everything he does. If then he possesses this gift only next in inferiority to divinity itself... Is it consistent to suppose it is only adapted to the minor details of life while it becomes a dangerous counsellor in the weightier matters of the soul? Such an idea is a libel upon the giver. So libel was the The word, word, yeah. yeah. And what meaning did you find? Um, That was a false statement that is damaging to a person's reputation. So it's a synonym also with slander. Or yep. defame or vilify. Yeah. It's a legal term, isn't it, Anto? Yeah. Oh. yeah. You can sue people for libel. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask a question about yeah. that bit? When he says about the noblest gift being the power to reason, is he mm-hmm. talking about free will? No, he's actually talking about the power we have to reason. The mind. Yes. Yeah. Right. So w- there's more to your question. Or what do you feel about that? I don't understand it. Because it says the, pa- the noblest gift is the power to reason and then it says next in inferiority to divinity itself. So, yeah, I didn't really understand it, what it meant. 
So he's just saying that this is this amazing gift that we've been given to use reason in our progression. But is that true, that the mind is a bigger gift that God's given us than like divinity or free will? Or he's love saying or? next to divinity. So he's saying it's divinity is the higher one, yeah. but the gift of reason, he's saying, is the noblest gift. So do you think it's the noblest gift? What do you think? What's the noblest gift? Is there a no? Alex? Humility, Humility you feel? Yeah. Carolina? Love? Yeah. Free will. Free will? Yeah. So I feel that it's useless talking to him, isn't it? He's just being, like he's saying, he's, remember that everyone's really enthusiastic in this world and they want to share this deep meaning with everyone. So he's saying this is an amazing gift and I do agree, your ability to reason is an amazing gift that you've been given by God. It helps you, if you think about it, um, discern different things. It's the way most of us first learn things. Remember I talked about going from the head to the heart? That's what most of us do. So this ability to reason and also... In this chapter, he talked, what's the, what's the great secret of the, secret of the universe that Eusmos tells him? What's the way to understand everything? This is earlier in the chapter. Um, Jason, yeah. Uh, the key is love. Love, exactly. And if we go back a bit in the chapter, um, he says, so this is page 25. Um, so on page 24, he asks, I'm sorry, I don't know what it is in the printout. It's similar, but... Um, he asks him, you know, will you teach me this grand art of solution? And Yusma says, yeah, it's simple. It's love. And on the next page, he says, um, undoubt it towards the bottom of the page. All laws have their root and centre in God and are therefore capable of being reasoned upon so far as we can comprehend them. So there's that idea of reason again. The so-called natural laws are spiritual laws translated into requisite expressions for physical existence and, if rightly understood, would serve as an index to spiritual progress. But really what he's saying here in this piece of the chapter is if we understand love, we have the greatest logic. Mm. And that's something, that's something really dear to me. Like if we understand the, the principle of love, we can reason about everything in God's universe. First, we need to know love. And then we'll understand how God's created everything and it just unlocks everything for us. We go, okay, I know what love is if, and I know that God's loving, so if he created this, how can I... I can naturally have an interface that's going to help me reason about how this thing works. So I feel, Kate, that that's really what um, Yusmos is... Like, this is the part of the theme of the chapter is the fact that um, if we understand love, then the reason is the... We can reason into every, and this is such a gift. Can you see it in that context? Like, if I understand that love is the thing that governs everything, and God created this flower, when I come to understand that flower, if I know love, so next to divinity, he says, if I know about God and about love, I can use my reason to completely understand this entire flower. So that's that's what I feel the meaning is in that paragraph. Does that? Um, so yeah. settle it for you. I think I got a bit confused because of how the mind stuff can be an injury on earth, like how we become we become logical without love, and then yeah. we get led away from yeah. love often. Yeah. And the great irony is we can never be logical without yeah. love, hey? Okay. Because our emotion is always going to lead us to be illogical. If you think about it, whenever you're holding on to something, you go, "No, I know that that's black and that's white," and really, it can be just because as a child. We were told it's black and white by dad and we really need dad's love, so that's definitely going to be black and that's going to be white. When yeah. Really, when we, when we love, when we let go of that, we go, oh, actually, that's a shade of blue and that's a pale yellow, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I agree. Yeah, like we think we're being logical, though, in that place, but it's yeah. not true. Yeah. yeah. I feel that nothing God has given us is wasted. You know, he had a purpose for all of it. And if we understand God, God is, like, loving. And so he's lovingly given us all of these gifts, all of these parts of ourselves. And it's just a matter of bringing ourselves into harmony with God's love. And then the gift is, like, amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So mind is not a dirty word. <laughs> uh, if we go to Alex... 
And then Joy and then Nina. Yeah, what I just felt about that is our reason is tainted by our injuries and yep. and so we can reason all we want and unless we want to feel about that, which is why I said the humility, you know, won't lead us to truth. Yeah. And hence to love. So, yeah. yeah. I mean it's all a great big beautiful jigsaw, isn't it? From everything we've learnt from AJ, um, which he's learnt from God, you know. But um I feel that Eusmos is just trying to impress upon Fred, like, hey, you know, love, and then reason, and then everything's solved. And really, to get to love, yes, we need humility, which will lead us to truth. And, yeah, so, yeah, cool. Okay, who's next? Joy, and then Nina, yeah. Yeah, Mary, I had a question about... Um, about <laughs> You're tricky to film. <laughs> on, the, on, the, <laughs> on the go. <laughs> on the top of page 22. Yeah. Um, it, when he, in the first paragraph... I've told you that love is the greatest power we know and this the soul is conscious as soon as it leaves the body. Mm -hmm. Is that true? As soon as the... I'd love to come back to this whole section about passing and the spirit body leaving the body and what Helen is talking about with him there. So do you mind... Nina, are you on this other topic we were on? Yeah, for me, just briefly, I had a yep. bit of an aha moment because... Um, when presented with several different options, say, that God might put before us, I had, well, which one is the truth, you know? And then I had this real insight, well, pick the most loving one and that will lead you to the truth as well. Exactly. And that was something I thought I'd share. Yeah, yeah. So it's that, it's that principle that I was speaking of, that if you understand love, you're going to be able to unlock everything you're going to be able to un and if you remembering that a quality of love is humility then we if we go okay this is what I know to be love right now I'm going to go with that and I'll be humble in this exploration and it might teach me more about love more about me and about the thing so yeah for, for we me can it help me understand that or put the, the concept right up there that everything that God does is loving so if I look at it from well, what is the most loving thing that God yes. would do, then that helped me come to a point of truth. And can you see how as well, if we have this faith that God is a God of love, it it's helps us so much in our progression. How many times have we learned about the law of attraction and gone, well, that's just bloody unfair? <laughs> yeah. A lot of people, uh, whether we've said it or felt it at some time or, or whatever, but if we, if we have faith and trust that God is a God of love, that changes our whole interaction with it, doesn't it? We go, actually, maybe there's something in me <laughs> that's out of harmony with love here that makes me feel like this is so unfair. Um, and this is something that um, in this chapter... Um, he talks about the different spheres and different regions being ruled, doesn't he? And Mario in Sweden wrote and he said, I was really triggered by that. I was really triggered, what did he say? Um, I was so disturbed to read that there are rulers in the spheres. Also about that it's an organisation, cherubs, archangels. I don't understand why this is written so when Michael the ex-archangel channeled by Mary in December 2011, said he did not want to be called that since there are not such differences in the celestial realms. I think it's great that Murray is so expressive about like this feeling that he's had because that's what I was going to refer to as the authority that God has. God does have authority. God does rule things. There are laws and there are levels and, and many of us have this injury that um, against authority because authority has been used to make us feel small and punish us and all these different things. Um, so this concept that God, God did create the law and it is loving and he has that authority is often where most of us stumble already. Um, so it's understanding that authority can be loving and in fact it is loving when used in harmony with love like in these fears. Uh, it's a ruler is more a leader and he was someone who is the most humble in that sphere. Uh, so uh, that's, that was my feedback from Mario as well, that it just is highlighting to him some of the feelings that he has around authority. And this idea of the cherubs and archangels that distressed him so much. Did anyone else think about that? Yeah. That again is just um, Fred telling the story 
And uh, I think it's Eusmos talking to him about that. And using um, terms that we on earth are going to understand. Yeah. It doesn't mean... That. There's so many gorgeous things in this chapter as well that I chuckled about. about um, he was talking about people's uh, understanding of what happens. And if, if what we believe to happen happened, you know, it would sound like a nightmare in heaven because everyone would be just thrown a harp and gone, yeah, just sing away. Which I thought was, I thought that was <laughs> hilarious and now I've lost the point of what I was saying. But uh, um, yeah, it's about this idea that other people might know more about love and truth than us and are we going to be willing to be open to that? Renee? Um. Just wondering, the leaders that um, sort of guide and direct if that's the correct word, each of the spheres, are they celestials or are they just someone that went like, oh, my God, I so want to share what was in the first sphere, so I'd love to... You know what I mean? They're actually so. the people who are in the, like, the most loving people in, the, in that sphere, you know. Um, sometimes there are celestial beings who come back to assist people in the first sphere, second, all those things, and have a special role there, like... Um, um, who is the person we meet after this? It doesn't matter because we'll talk about him when we get to it. But, um, you know, and Eusmos is of a higher condition of love than where he is, where he is serving. Um, but very often the ruler is someone from just the sphere above or just at the top of that sphere who is serving the people in that sphere. So, yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome if the earth was ruled that way? Yeah. 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 Someone else had their hand up over here. Anto. You know, I just thought it was really amazing, the fact that um, you've got a teacher who God has appointed to actually meet Afra for the first time. Yeah. And the truth that he's giving him is um, confirming the, all the foundations of what he really feels. So it's, it's not like learning new truth for him. It's just a confirmation of those true foundations of how there is God's love and, yeah. and what he really feels. And I thought that's just really amazing. Yeah, well, it's amazing, isn't it, that he had that much truth in him yeah. as a sort of a foundation. Um, but then as we go along, it just opens up for him. Um, but it is such a gift, isn't it, that each of us, every single one of us is assigned at least one person right now. And that's, what, you know, bring it back to your life. Right now, there's a person with you all the time who is assigned by God, if you desire them to be there, who's going to be there to help you. So... It doesn't have to start when we hit the spirit world. Thanks, Jesus and Mary. <laughs> no, I wasn't meaning me. <laughs> I was meaning your spirit guide. <laughs> Thanks, Anto. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So where were we up to? What were we talking about? Um, the reason. The beauty of reason. Yeah. So if we go back now to a bit earlier in the chapter and talk about um, the point that Joy raised, or the, the par- so start of page 22, and it's talking about what happens when we pass. So um, Fred's asking Helen, or Helen's sort of saying, come on, we need to move on now because there's still a, an attraction to your body. You might want to go back there. And she talks to him a little bit about... Um, I've told you that love is the greatest power we know. Of this the soul is conscious so soon as it leaves the body, and the perturbation of friends has therefore a sympathetic attraction, too strong for its resistance. It forms an anchor which binds the spirit to the earth. Sometimes we have much difficulty in counteracting the pernicious influences of grief, which love would certainly prompt the bereaved ones to restrain if they could but once be made a witness to the effects it produces. So what did you guys, did anyone have any questions? Like, what do you feel about that paragraph before I launch into my yet die? And if we can go to Sandra after that. I just had a question about um, what Helen was describing in that bit. So my question is, is she describing the grief as a mix of love and unloving emotions um, and is pure love associated with grief? Yeah. So this is, this is good. This is what I wanted to talk about. Do you want... Sandra, was that a similar question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
So this is something that I felt about a lot as I was reading as well. Helen's saying it's love that's drawing a person back to the earth. And I asked myself the same question. Now, hang on, if I really love, do I grieve? And, and I chose AJ about it and I felt about it and prayed about it a bit more. I feel very clear that most grief that occurs on the earth is really the, the basis of an addiction not being met anymore. Um, and therefore, I feel Helen is using the word love in a way that Fred would understand it at this point in his progression. But the higher truth we know is that that's not actually love when we're grieving an addiction. Um, so it's not a pure emotion that we have for the person. Because naturally, if we had a pure emotion for the person, we would want them to go on their way and be free and not stay bound to us in this earth plane. Um, but there is an element of... And it's hard because I haven't gone through all of my own grieving, which is why I had to really sit with this. I do feel that there is a pure part of loss or separation called longing. And this is the feeling that you have for your soulmate in a pure state, which is a sense of desire to be near that person that does not want to impact upon their free will in any way. It is purely a pure desire. Do you understand what I mean? And I feel it's difficult for us because most of us haven't done this grieving and so we're talking about it as a concept instead of a, a feeling, which is why I trotted off to AJ because I think he has it more here than here now. You know, He's still grieving some things, but he certainly has a pure longing, which is such a different, if I can describe what it's like to experience that on the other end, um, it is such a different feeling than, say, what I feel from my parents who are grieving me not being in their life, which is a very, like, <coughs> feeling and one that I feel guilty and heavy about. And when I allow myself to feel AJ's longing for me, it is like a... It's a lighter-than-air kind of a feeling. It's a gifting, almost, feeling, like I'm being given something. So, yeah... Um, I thought that was a great thing to talk about, though, at this point, about what is grief and what does that really mean. Uh, Geraldine, yep. Um, I see a difference between hanging on to grief and actually going through the grieving process. So uh, I think yes. that if you're hanging on to your grief and you're not submitting to the grief and allowing yourself to fully feel your feelings, then, yes, you'll be attracting someone in the spirit world that you're actually refusing to grieve. Yes. Whereas if you do go through that process, well, then they'll feel free to go. Fantastic point. The, the issue is, and this is relevant for a lot of us in our processing, there is a tears that you can cry, which are like effects-based, addiction-based tears. I'm not getting what I want. I want what I want. I want what I want. I want what I want. I'm not getting what I want. I'm crying because I don't get what I want. And... Um, then there is the, the surrender cry of, I can't have what I want. That is the healing cry and that is the cry where the emotion leaves us and it's also not... Like if Ange had passed and I'm attached to Ange, um, I can cry, oh, I really want Ange, I really miss her, oh, I can't bear life without Ange, oh my gosh, I can't... You know, uh, the, all that is like pulling Ange towards me. Whereas if I just cry, Ange is gone, I'm so sad. Now, Ange... And, and I'll get on to this as the next point, but Ange might have her own feelings about that that may, depending on her soul condition, cause some attraction. But while I'm <coughs> grieving that feeling, it's going to be leaving me. So it's a fantastic point, Geraldine, that once it's gone from me, then even regardless of Ange, just, it, it will leave me when I acknowledge I can't ever have Ange back in my life as she, as she was in the physical. I can grieve that. And that, that feeling will leave me because that's a, more of a real feeling and then Andrew would feel less attracted. However, yeah, uh, Tara... Yeah. Because someone overseas asked a really good question about this that I'd like to answer too. Can I give the example of my mum? Yeah, sure. Um, she started having the morphine to put her in the coma. So Tara's mum, Gloria, passed... How many years ago now? Um, it'll be three, three this May. Yep. And we were all in the hospital room at Bondi. And um, I just was hanging on to her. 
right until the last minute. Yeah. I even brought in this tonic, you know, for her to, um, to try and help her. And so when she was sort of comatose from the um, morphine, I was avoiding a lot of stuff and then right at the end I just sat beside her and just grieved and grieved and grieved but I realised that it was my grief about all the things we wouldn't be doing together and yeah. how I was going to miss her and she was my best friend and, you know, um, it was all about me. Yeah. And, and funnily enough, Liam had told me this a few years ago, being a funeral director, mm -hmm. that he came home one day and said, when people grieve... It's only their own loss that they're grieving. Yeah. And I sort of went, oh, yeah, but then I understood. And then I, I think I sat there and cried for an hour with mum. And then finally I just started praying for her. I just felt like, oh, I actually can just pray for her now. I don't have to hang on to her yeah. anymore. Yeah. And I think within an hour she'd passed. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's a powerful demonstration of how, yeah, how it works. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, isn't it, that head-heart thing where you hear it, you go, yeah, yeah, but then you live it and you go, no, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tara. Jennifer in the States asked a question about this. Uh, she said, on page 21 of the download, so it's 22 in our book, they're talking about being pulled back through the mists, which is just where we've been, and how the helpers do their best to encourage newcomers to go forward, not back to earth. So it brought up the questions. What determines whether a person makes it through the mist in the first place? We hear of so many that do, that do not even get that far, then get stuck in the earth plane. Does everyone get accompanied? If not, what determines that? So it's a good question, isn't it? Does anyone have any ideas about that? Jason, yeah? Uh, the first part about the grief would be a law of attraction event because obviously if you've dealt with a lot of your own grief, you would have understanding and compassion about what they're going through, but you wouldn't be affected. Yeah, partly, yep. What other things might affect it? There's quite a lot, actually, Renee. I feel as though people are, like, dead against and, and um, completely believe that this body will just rot in the ground after we die and there is no afterlife. The people that would try and assist them through the mist, they'd be like, who the hell are you? Like... Yep. Sort of. So, yeah, so Jason's talking about the unresolved emotions that we have while on Earth. You're talking about the belief systems we have while on Earth. Both of those things are a factor in the answer to this question. Uh, Ange? Uh, the condition that the person passes in, like Afra was do doing an act of love when he passed and mm -hmm. was in a reasonably good condition... So Yeah, so like the emotions that are present at the time, at the time of, passing. of passing. So yeah. if I'm in terror when I'm passing or, or if, if I'm... you're murdering somebody. <laughs> if you're murdering someone, if you're being murdered. Yeah. So the emotions... So Jason's talking about the emotions stored in our, in our um, soul, which is true. You're talking about the emotions at the time of passing. And Renee's talking about the overall belief system we have about passing. All of these things are factors. What other things are factors? Alan? I'm still trying to get a handle on the fact that is the grieving process a law that God designed or did man create that through the fall under the sixth sphere? It seems that grieving is a catalyst for spiritual progression on earth or in the spirit world. Do you know why that often is? Is because during the grieving process... Um we connect with our soul, <laughs> you yeah. know, we connect with stored emotions inside of us mm. and very often we also ask questions, why is this happening? And that's often a catalyst for us to change and grow. Mm. I don't believe, God created as in everything loving that God does, he created the potentials within the grieving process yeah. to be like that. Yeah. I don't believe he created us to necessarily have to have a grieving process to catalyse us. Like the little toddler in the room, full of love and full of adventure, yeah. Yeah. they're going to learn and go for it. Mm. The person who's been in the, the silent, quiet, dark room for years and years, sometimes the experience of their grief makes them want to open the door and, and explore things. Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So... Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just found it interesting when AJ told us, it just hit me really hard one day, that if you don't actually have grief from 
attachment to another person, you don't actually have to grieve. It's not yeah. a... It's not the catalyst for soul progression. No. Yeah, I just thought, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around it, but I think I need to feel more grief yeah. to understand yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that's the key, isn't it? It's all about the grief about like, whoa, how much have I missed and what is this progression and all those things. Yeah, yeah. Tim? Um, I just thought of the sum total of how much love and error is inside of your soul. Yeah. So, like, you know, as you pass, like, whether you have enough love in your soul to have enough energy to move in any direction, but also um, what, like, you might actually be terrified of love, so you'll be repelled by those exactly. circumstances. So Jennifer asks, what, what, what helps, like, what means we get through the mist and what doesn't, and what means we get assistance and what means we, we don't? So, to me, the thing... The issues that affect how we get through the mists, let's just talk about that first, they are how attached I am to my life on earth. If I'm totally hooked into my life on earth, it's going to be like I'm not going to feel that motivated to leave it. It's going to be about the unhealed emotions that I have inside of me that create the attachments to people or my life on earth. Uh, What else did I write? What I believe about passing. Do I believe I'm just going to go to the ground? Do I believe there's going to be like Jesus and I'll go and sit at his right hand? Like all of those things affect how not only how we get through the mist, but who comes to us. If I'm full of fear about passing, uh, then I I might not be taken through the mist by anyone because I'm repelling them all and it's freaking me out even more having people come to me. Sometimes I might be really open, like, um, was it in the last chapter where the old man um, was passing and he said, they've come for me, you know? It's not Jesus, though. Jesus wouldn't come for me, but people have come for me. And so he was at least open to having people there to usher him through. And because he'd lived a really moral life as well, there was a lot of people with the desire to help him with that. Um, so how much I want to be helped or how afraid I may be of helpers or the dying process or the physical death process, how attached I am to my life on earth, how hooked I am into other people's feelings. So these are things like guilt, feeling responsible, needing people's approval. All of those things are going to affect our passing massively. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm really hooked into Ange and she's really grieving and about me not being there, if I feel guilty, it's going to be hard for me to leave her. Can you see that? Um, and how hooked I am into addictions on earth. If I'm an alcoholic and I've been in hospital for six months and haven't had a drink, when I pass, it's going to be mighty tempting to go and hang out at a bar. <laughs> That's a pretty crude example, but it might be other addictions, you know. But So all of those things are going to affect how, I, how my passing is through the mist and how I'm accompanied. The other factor is, and can I point out that all of those things are your soul condition. Your soul condition isn't just a few causal emotions in the background. Your soul condition is the total of your beliefs, your desires, your unhealed emotions, what's happening for you right now, the actions you're taking right now. All of that is your soul condition. So in answer to Jennifer's question, what determines what make, what a pers- how a person moves through the mist, it's their soul condition. And for each one of us, it's unique at the time of passing. So it's going to be very likely a different experience for all of us. Um, The other factor, to me it kind of came to me like an equation. There's this, all of my belief systems, plus or minus the people around me, the people in my life as I pass. So their feelings about my passing, how much they're addicted to me, what they project at me, but how much what they project at me affects me is still dependent on the first half of the equation, which is my soul condition. So that's sort of how it works as we, as we pass. Does anyone have any questions about that? Nat, did you have a question about that? Just wait for the mic, yeah. And then Raj, yeah. Just when you were talking about the emotions, I was, um, I've been feeling into some of the spirits around me of late and uh, anger and rage would play a big part in that. Um, for example, um, if I was raped and died in that act, because I have anger at men to start with, yep. um, I, I know that I would want to take a vengeful position over the way that I died and I would, that feeling of injustice and not wanting to, you know, the avoidance that, the, that I'm sitting with anyway would perhaps keep me earthbound. 
as well? Definitely, definitely. And that is a big tragedy is that a lot of people who've actually been really harmed on Earth end up staying in the Earth plane because of the unresolved feelings that that's bringing up. And often it's because of unresolved feelings that were in them that's attracted the, the event as well. I know for myself that I've had memories about my passing in the first century, which was um, very violent, um, so rape and torture-based sort of uh, death. And my memories that even though I had love in me to the condition of the third sphere, I still passed into the first sphere more because of the terrible um, terror and grief that, that I needed to process in order to go where the condition of love that I, you know, that I was, that I'd received to be at. Yeah, yeah. so that, that um, thing that Anne raised about what's actually happening at the moment of your death is quite relevant as well. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Cool. Uh, Raj. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it seems um, what you're really referring to is, is the degree of resistance we have in that moment of, of coming to... The passing. The pass, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's how much resistance we have to moving on, which is the natural occurrence, and it's all of the things on Earth that are holding us or providing us with that resistance. Yes. How willing we are to let go. Yeah. And, and the belief, like how, like you said, the resistance, and within that, our belief systems, how attached we are to yeah. our belief systems. Yeah. And and the other thing is, you, you just mentioned the uh, somebody in a violent situation. And it just suddenly occurred to me, you know, Jesus would always talk about turn the other cheek so that you're not holding on to revenge yeah. or affecting something because that will immediately retard your, or create resistance to retarding your opportunity to move. Yes, absolutely. If we can see death as an opportunity rather than a, something we need to avoid at all costs, yeah. everything would change. Well, if we could see a whole every single day as an opportunity, uh, a gift from God to help us grow, then yeah, then we might view death within it as another part of that yeah. opportunity. No yeah. wonder he's excited. <laughs> yeah, and curious. Yeah. Uh, if you just go next to you, Raj Um Just want to clarify something: when you die and you go through the mist, is that going into the spirit world? Yes. And those who don't go through the mist are earthbound. Yes. Yeah. And just behind you to Sherry. Yeah. Uh, so at your time of passing, yeah. but every person is approached by someone who could help them if they want it, and in that moment they're rejecting or accepting that help? Um, yeah, but often, like, as you know, the soul is the thing that governs everything. So often, if I am absolutely terrified of spirits or what's happening, you know, someone may try and approach me but just be repelled by the level of fear that I have. So for some people, yes, like, and often people on their deathbed kind of... Uh, do sort of relate that, oh, there's people or, oh, there's people, you know, um, and that definitely affects how. But there's always, as I said in one of the other weeks, there is always help available. It's just similar to what Raj says, whether we're... Yeah, so sorry, Sharon. It's yeah, whether we whether we desire the help or not. So if we totally don't desire it, it may be that no one appears to us. Yeah. Someone would be assigned, definitely. Okay. And so it is just so they can be earthbound until that point that they have the desire either for help or for that situation to change. Yes. And then they'll go through the mist. Yes. And yeah. someone will take them through the mist at that point. If they desire it. If they desire that. Yeah. Help. Yeah, yeah. So a really, like, more than we realise, number of spirits are just earthbound. Like, lots. I think I asked Rachel, my God, the other day, and she said two or three times the world's population in spirits is earthbound. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm always dodgy about, oh, I don't trust my mediumship, but, you know, that, yeah, that's a lot of people, isn't it? Jane? Oh, my gosh, everyone's hands. Are... <laughs> Mary, what about um, the individuals on Earth who have been so overcloaked by spirits that, yeah. like, what would happen to them? They've got no, re- when they pass, they don't even know their real selves. So would they yeah. be a lot more earthbound as well, or would they receive... Yeah, I'm just wondering. Like, yeah, it, it depends, Jane, because at the moment of passing, the overcloaking can't be maintained. So there is a moment for a lot of people when they realise, or well, they're disorientated. What's going on? I don't even feel who, you know, this identity crisis feeling. Um, and many of those people are helped then through the mists. But it depends. If you remember, many of the conditions that allow long-term overcloaking is a lack of humility, a desire for power and a desire for glory. If people are still resisting those emotions, they can stay earthbound. And actually, often, they begin overcloaking other people in order to get those addictions fed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Carolina? And then to Ali after that, yeah. A while ago, you guys gave an example of a two-year-old being earthbound, and I was confused by that. How does a little kid not go through the myths? I... Well, it's in. Remember, I talked about the equation, so soul condition plus or minus the emotions of the people around the person who passes when they pass. That is very much related to the people around that child at the time of passing. So not wanting to let go. And you can guarantee for a two-year-old there's a lot of, like, assistance. There's a lot of people working, not just with the spirit of the child, but with the people on earth who are still holding on to it. But they they can't override what the actual soul interaction is happening. So sometimes children do remain earthbound. Often as well, it's... You know how Helen talks about he's passed through the mists... And then she said, there's still a magnetic pull. We need to move you on. Often, you know, a child can almost like make it through the mist and be pulled back or make it through the mist for a little while, but still the, the feelings and of the parents on earth bring them back because they're just, there's so much projection of take away my pain, take away my pain. The sad thing is the parents, sometimes parents say they're aware of their child still with them and they see that as a good thing. Um, but sometimes the parents aren't even aware that the child is, can't get away from them. They're still in this grieving thing because the child's not physically there in front of them. Yeah. So what happens when the parents pass away and the and child's still earthbound? Like, say, all the people that have pulled the child in and yeah. they all pass away, then does that child then have an opportunity or is absolutely. it stuck? No, absolutely. And also the child would have... Um, like, it, there might be many... It might not need to wait until um, the the parents pass. It might just happen, you know, as the parents, something else happens in their life, you know? Yeah, so it's not a... Remember, as, as is said through this chapter, it's not a set in stone uh, final judgment. Nothing is static in God's universe, you know? There's always... Love's always working on us. Like, you can feel it, can't you? Love's working on your soul, trying to bring you back into harmony with it all the time. So, yeah. Okay, Nat. I'm just curious to know if that same applies to newborns um, and miscarried children with the grief of, or stillborn children even, that yeah. grief of the parents can yeah. potentially hold that child earth. Definitely. Okay. It, like we're saying, though, it's, it's different... Sure. You know, for all different situations. Um, and often because that child has only been with the mother a brief amount of time, there's less bonding. Sometimes when a child has been sick with, like, leukaemia or something for, a, you know, six months before they pass, there's a lot of emotion focused at that child and a lot of grief from other issues in a person's life that's then projected on that child, like, they're the hope. They're, if, if my child dies, then the whole world is screwed up. Never mind that I felt the whole world was screwed up before and this is just, like, a catalyst for me for that feeling, you know. Yep. So there's a lot of intense pressure sometimes on a child who's been sick for a long time. So then using Tara's example where she 
got to a point where she just prayed and wanted her mum to go and she yeah. was trusting the process. If yeah. the parents in that situation reach a point where they're going to trust the process that the child will be fine and that God will look after them, does that then release that pull? I, it does, as long as they're also humble to the... This, like for many mothers, their sense of identity comes from being a mother. Yeah. So they, ha- they have to be willing to be humble to that feeling as well. Otherwise, they still want the child to meet that. Or, you know, so the, all the other emotions, the whole world's screwed up. I have to be willing to be humble to the fact that that's my emotion. It's not related to my child, you know, yep. those things. Thanks, yeah. man. No worries. Lorleen? Oh, sorry, Ali first and then Lorleen. Yep. This whole concept has really made me think about Daniel Morecambe. Mm-hmm. and the effect that his parents have had on him. Um, like, I don't know how many years of effort and energy they've put into trying to find yeah. his murderer. Um, so, if for people who are not from Queensland, uh, Daniel Morecambe was... Uh, I think he was eight, was he? I can't remember. Thirteen. Oh, there you go. It's a very famous case of a young boy who went missing at a bus stop. Uh, how many years ago? Five, six, seven, eight... More, about ten. Nine, ten. But... Even now, there's like a, a David Morecambe Foundation. It was just heavily publicised. There was a lot of community emotion projected at this little boy and what was going on. And so, obviously, yeah, that has an effect on him. Sometimes um, it depends upon, obviously, the emotion. What is the emotion being projected? Is it just natural care and concern and desire for him to be saved or or is there unresolved grief and very often there is unresolved grief of parents that drives them to create foundations and all these these other things it can be done with a pure intent but very often it's not yeah and I spoke to um get him anyway I spoke to um one of the kids who did the Columbine shooting um in the, spirit, I, in the spirit, he came to me one day when I was full of rage and not wanting to feel my grief at injustice. And he came and um, I was talking to him about what his life is about now. He's still earthbound and he just lives off the feeling. Like He, he doesn't live off it, but he, he's drawn to the feelings of so many young people who feel like there's so much injustice and, oh, and that you know, this kid did this thing and they almost look up to him and he's living off this kind of glorified feeling or people's fascination, what made these kids do it and there's so much, like, emotional energy projected at him that he prefers that than going to face, which was what I was not wanting to do, going to face the pain that he had, not just about his life up until the shooting, but what he did in the shooting. So it can be for many reasons that people stay earthbound. It can be the unresolved grief or it can be the fact that they're getting... The earth and the earth's condition is kind of amenable to them more than this where they're going to go to when they pass. Yeah. Hmm. Ooh, heavy, hey? <laughs> How did you guys relate this to your own life? What did it make you think about in terms of your own life on earth now, Lizzie? Um, my realisation is how um, my, both Lucy and Kate, how they're so desperate for me not to die. Because mm-hmm. I asked them. And they said they'd just be so devastated. So it made me realise the addictions that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how much this thing that I talked about, your soul condition, the desire for approval, the, mm-hmm. the feeling of responsibility, the guilt, all of that, how that's really linking you guys together, even while on earth. Yeah, Yeah. hugely. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ellen? I just need to... I recently just saw the the movie The Hereafter. Yep. And the focus on the movie is how these people have been affected by a near-death experience and they saw the mist. Mm -hmm. But it's about their relationships on earth and how there's addictions in play. and yeah. But there's also desires in the movie. And it's a really interesting one if, and yep. no one's ever seen it. Because yep. the second time I saw the movie, I didn't pick up that there was desires on the earth, on our plane where we are, and that they hadn't fulfilled those desires and it wasn't their time to go even though they died. But they, there was no focus on who were the people that came to them in the mist 
to say that it's time for you to go back. Yeah. But you could feel that that's what was happening to some of them. Yeah. Can you you know how you use the term? It wasn't their time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that there is a time allocated for us to go? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess that's why I was reflecting on the second time I saw the movie about desires. Mm -hmm. uh, there was um, this lady who was a journalist, a very high-profile woman. She she sort of didn't know what was going on. She got wiped out in a tsunami. Mm -hmm. She had no memory of what happened in the in the in the near-death experience. Mm -hmm. But it was when she was confronted with a relationship that was breaking down that she started remembering that there was more going on in the mist than what was going on in her life. Yeah. And that opened her up to feeling that she, she hadn't fulfilled what she wanted to do on earth, mm -hmm. even though she was the highest paid journalist in Europe at yeah. the time. And um, so she wrote the book, The Hereafter. Yeah. And you don't get that till, sorry, so the end of the movie. So just ruined the movie. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I've seen it, so I wasn't feeling anxious about that. <laughs> Usually, Sorry. that's my huge but, anxiety. Don't tell me. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, I don't actually feel that there's a time allocated because everything, remember, is governed by our soul condition. Right. So it is true that some of us can have desires, loving desires, and desires in error that may lead us back from death in a near death experience. Yeah. Or. Um, our injuries might lead us to stay attached to the earth. Do you think that may, that's good? Do you think that maybe if there was some funding available to the organisation, that you and uh, AJ could make the next stage of that movie, or sort of a? Look, there's so much talk about making movies at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll be an extra in the movie. <laughs> you guys can create it. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to be the one in the mist that goes up to the person and helps them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, lovely. Uh, um, this was relating to um, when we go through the mist or not. Um, um, is it um, like I had this feeling um, that the spirits who are quite damaged, they have a lot of um, possession over uh, this related to young children dying? Uh, especially in China, where a lot of the girls were killed because they were girls. Girls, yeah. And um, to increase their, what we say, power and their whatever, mm -hmm. the, the, the female spirits hooked on to the... This is just the feeling I got through mm -hmm. some stuff. Um, and didn't let them progress and kept them earthbound so that then when they grew under their protection... Um, they became more powerful and that, that the feeling of so many of these, uh, that's why the, the Asian female mm -hmm. power is so strong yeah. that, that one of them was the injustice they feel, the degree of mm -hmm. damage, mm -hmm. that it's so strong that it will hook into anyone to try and make them more powerful so they stop even young children from going in yep. through the mist. Is that, would that be right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So how do you relate that to your lives, guys? If that's a true thing that's happening, what does that mean for us? Or, yep, Sherry. And so, actually, go to Deidre first and then share it on you. Um, I often wonder, because I'm so resistant to feeling my pain, mm -hmm. is that I've often wondered, would I even be able to handle my location in the spirit world? And I probably, right now, if I died right now, I'd probably be earthbound because it would just be... I've often wondered, would I even be able to handle it? So, Deidre, what do you think about the choice, though, that you have? Because you, you often say to me, like, I don't... I can't handle my pain. I'm honest, and I love your honesty. I'm honest, you know, I'm angry or whatever. But what do you think about the choices that you have? In I, front I made of you? a choice that I don't want to hurt anyone anymore. <laughs> so, um... so that's going to require some <laughs> humility, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess that's where um, sometimes I feel like um, sometimes some of you say things like, "Yep, I'm angry, and that's just the way it is," and, and I think, "Okay, that's true." But 
what about desire? <laughs> what has led you to be in this room with us right now? Like, if there isn't a desire to love, then there's pretty pointless listening to what I'm saying because I'm just going to be talking about that. That's my, you know, that's my <laughs> soapbox <laughs> is the love bit. And so if we don't have a desire to love, um, off, like, I agree there's a lot of grief, but often there's a big choice we've made. No. I'm, I'm not going to care. And, and that's the anger bit that I was talking to you guys about last yeah. week. And that's the bit where until you make a different choice, anything I say, it doesn't, it's not really going to make an impact, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I made a choice. I don't want to hurt anyone else anymore. So cool. I'm going to have to face my mistakes yeah. and the pain yeah. I've caused yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. true. Yeah. I guess what I think about with the Chinese women in the spirit world... Oh, Sheridan, you want to...? I'm, uh, I'm not sure, I'll like, whether I'm on the right track, yeah. but what one of the things I'd reflected on is just how often I get sucked into thinking the way things were was OK, mm -hmm. like in avoidance of my pain. Yeah. So just being pulled at, back to what is actually hurting me and others rather than moving forward. Like, yeah. that's sort of what I was reflecting on yeah. about going forward. And I yeah. know I have a choice. Yeah. And I think it was after the second session, I had a big cry about um, just feeling around time and feeling like there isn't enough time mm -hmm. to be a good person, to mm -hmm. to get into the condition. So if I, I can just get to the hells and start there, like, you know, yeah. just face how dark I am. Yeah. And there's a feeling I can't do it now. Like, yeah. And this is, this is similar to what I was saying to Deirdre, isn't it? Yeah, it's about it's making same. a choice. Now, Fred isn't in the seventh sphere. He wasn't in the seventh sphere on earth. You know, he's just in the first, top of the first, start of the second. And look at what he achieved on earth, how many people's lives he touched. And we see more and more as we go through the book how many lives he touched. So I feel it's a cop-out to say I'm not in the condition. I just feel it's a cop out. And when I feel about um, all these kids who are aborted in China and who are bound to the earth, what I think about is, wow, that means the earth's condition is so conducive to that. There is so much fear and anger on this planet that spirits can continually do that. Where am I in that? Mm. What, what, what condition am I generating in my soul that is going to impact everything because you, you've got a soul now you can't avoid the responsibility <laughs> it happened God created you so <laughs> the way you use your will is going to impact not only you but everyone around you so I think about these Chinese girl children in the spirit world and I go wow how can I use mediumship to help them how can I grow in love so much that there is actually a place on the earth where love rules, even just a little bit, that they might be able to be assisted? Because right now they're surrounded with so much darkness that the light ones can't even get in. And that's not just because of what's condi the conditions in the spirit world, but it's what's on this globe, it's what's on this planet, that there's no light, there's no differentiation, you know. So this is what I feel about when I think about these things, is how does this relate to my life? Wow. Where am I a part of this? Yeah. We'll go to Joy and then I really want it. We're nearly out of time and there's so much more I'd like to just go through in this chapter. It's really just what, on following up what you were saying because you asked um, how does this affect me, the whole story of the, Through the Mists, I find just even more inspiring to go closer to God and grow more in love and learn as much as I can on earth while we have this amazing opportunity to do so mm -hmm. um, yeah. with that with you and, yep. and Jesus here at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it, it, it's, it's about how, what are we doing with our talents? What are we doing with, you know, the, in the preface, it talks mm. about every, God's given us all these gifts. Mm. What are we doing with them? Mm. Yeah. Well, that's a big lesson I've had recently too, is to realise that all my gifts and talents came from God and so what am I doing in service of God mm -hmm. with those gifts and talents? Yep. And yep. the only things I can do is grow in love and grow closer to God. So that um, and follow your passion. And follow my passion because remember, God gave you that passion in order to. I don't believe anyone who connects with their passion won't serve the world. Like a movie, <laughs> like a movie. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. What are the other awesome points in this chapter? Because we um, there's some pretty um, good ones. 
Anyone? Yep, Alison. I love the description that he gave of the landscape. Yeah. And the words he used. It was like, yeah. I want to go there. I want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few people overseas said that to me, like, oh, I want to go there. It yeah. sounds really exciting, like a travel destination. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yep. So we see the beauty of the spirit world. What, what other points stood out to you guys in this chapter? Uh, Renee and then Tim after that. That God's always been there for us. And if we have a desire, um, there is always through God's laws, they're loving and he's, yeah. it's just really beautiful and ordered. Yeah. And he talks, I, I love that um, we touched briefly before on love being the logic in all the laws. But he says, I felt this was very powerful. Um, it's actually following on from where I read before on chapter 25. He says, um, he starts the paragraph, all laws, and root, all laws have their root and centre in God and therefore we can understand the natural laws that are related to the spiritual laws. He says here though, the struggle for supremacy of creed and influence has unfortunately resulted in exalting the letter of the law while the spirit of its revelation has been ignored. What does that mean? Because it's quite powerful what it means. Uh, Nina? I think it's sort of what we've really been talking about. It's like I'm stating a truth, but we're not really connecting to the love in the message. Yes, so the spirit of the revelation, which is love and God's love, is often ignored. And they're talking there about the church and uh, different societal institutions as well, where they're willing to see the law, for example, thou shalt not kill, and then punish people through that law. So they've lost the spirit of the... There's no love then inherent in the law. God has that law that, yes, if you kill someone, there's a penalty on your soul. But... Another part of it, and I can't, maybe someone can tell me where it is, where he talks about the laws never being punishing. Um, uh, um, 29. Yes, that they're remedial and never punitive or vindictive. It is, in this life, every man is held responsible for his own deliberate acts and motives, but all consequent punishment is remedial, not vindictive. So that's 29, on page 29 of the book. And so what Yusmos is saying to him here is that people on earth now are trying to enforce these laws without the spirit of love. They're punishing in the name of the law, which is actually losing the meaning of the law. Yeah. So I thought that was quite powerful. Uh, Tim, you had another point about the chapter? Yeah, just on lower part of page 29, sort of goes in theme with what we're talking about. Yep. With, um, this is what I took from it at least, um, the gifts from God and the ability to use them from lower spheres. Um, I think it must be a Bible passage where he says, His light shineth on every land. He maketh the rain fall on the fields of the evil and the good. Yeah, so that's that's saying that God's love, God's love is catering to everyone. Yeah, and yeah. So then it continues. So men may fail, but God is the same forever. Yeah, yeah, which is beautiful and similar to what Renee was saying. Hey, yeah. Did anyone reflect on what that means in your life? Are you are you feeling that in your life? Are you remembering that in your life? Similar to what uh, Elvira asked. Uh, spoke of in the beginning, you know, this thing that realising that God has compassion for us and that we can have compassion for ourselves and other people as well. Yeah. Who had their hand up? Uh, Moni, if we go to Moni at the back and then Nat. I'd love to hear from some of you who haven't raised your hands yet. I'm sure you've got uh, lots of things written in your books. Yep, Mon? Um, I really liked on the bottom of page 22 in the printout, um, mm -hmm. talking about God, um, heaven um, and it says, um, let your imagination conjure before you all you wish for or all you would dare to crave. Picture to yourselves all you think of heaven and then revel among the anticipations and then multiply that by a thousand times. It's like I just let myself dream and, and it's like I don't let myself dare to dream but that there are good things like God has like um, then it goes on that made provision for the enjoyment of the righteous when their blood-stained feet have reached the goal of heaven. Like, yeah. 
like I don't know, it's just too much in that. Like yeah. my heart was just over overflowing with like. Yeah. And imagine, Mon, that feeling, holding that feeling as a desire and how powerful that would be in your life. You know, it's such, a, like, it's such an emotional um, passage where he says, O oh, hearts, the milestones of whose pig- pilgrimage are lettered alternatively with battle, defeat and failure. Ye, art- ye outcast wayfarers ostracised from all that, was, all that once was dear. Ye who are hungering for a look of sympathy thirsty for a kindly word, groping for one ray of hope, ye crushed and mangled, maimed and tortured on the rack of social propriety, ye banned and banished from a soul, soulless church because your weary feet have stumbled by the way. And it goes on, you know, this, this picture of these people who have, you know, suffered on earth, but what awaits them? And to me, like, what I feel about is gee, how uncomfortable am I with suffering? Even if it's for a, for a moral cause, you know? I, I have this passion to, to serve God through my desire, which is to teach everyone about God. But when the going gets rough and people call me an idiot and, like, um, that it's all evil and we're... You know, that I'm not that... You know, how willing am I just to be humble to that knowing, having faith that love rules this universe, and one day I'm going to, you know, feel the rewards of a loving intent. Because that's a lot of um, what is in this chapter as well, is about the basis of everything is our intent. And if my intent is loving, God sees that. And I sometimes I forget that and I want all of you to see it and then I'll feel okay about it instead of just trusting, okay, is my heart loving right now and do I trust God enough that if I follow a loving desire, there there will be joy and rewards and ultimately happiness for myself. Yeah. Okay. Sam? Um, Yeah, a similar emotion, just how you're talking about that faith in God's design. Um, In the paragraph, the duty of the earth is to ground the soul in the practical principles of love in order to fit fit it for its entrance upon the higher duties of this estate. And our Father knows the requirements and capacities of his children and so designed the course of their spiritual education. Mm. Like, it's just such a beautiful yeah. feeling that that evokes in me that yeah. god that has designed this cared for yeah, yeah like with care and with love for our every need but i it also brought up an emotion of or a question rather that like if a soul can pass before they're individualized and born um remember they into individualize at the moment of incarnation which is when they enter the womb so yeah, right. But they, they're not fully aware of it, obviously, because we're all learning about that individualisation. Yeah. 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 It was just, oh, like, I'm wondering if a soul can pass before it's fully individualised yeah. um, and go to summer land yeah. and be nurtured and seem to progress so much quicker than perhaps if they'd had a life on Earth. Like, just sort of how necessary is that? Do you Earthly know, stage. Do yeah. you know what I'm? Do you know what I'm saying? I think I do. And what I wanted to say was, um, we talk about a, a lot about the love that is there for a child who enters Summerland, but perhaps we don't talk enough about the pain that that child suffers, <laughs> because it is extreme <laughs> when they're miscarried or aborted. You know. There is, especially if they're aborted, there's a lot of feeling of utter rejection of themselves as a person. Utter rejection. Uh, This person that they incarnate into who they're so close to immediately, you know, and they're coming with love and love binds and they're attached to this person and then that person not only doesn't want them, ends their life, there is a huge amount of pain that that little being has to go through in Summerland. So yes, Summerland is designed to assist that little person and also then they have to grieve. There's so much grief, isn't there, about the fact that they don't get to experience life on Earth. They're soulmates often on Earth. 
you know, all of these things that they have a very different experience to us. So I feel that God's love is inherent in everything that happens. But I think we need to be careful about thinking, oh, it's all going to be, you know, a box of chocolates in the in the spirit world because our soul is our soul and our soul is... Um, God has created this process of like incarnation and understanding our individual self and our soul as a process of learning and discovery. And whatever we come into contact with affects us in a negative or positive way. And so this being killed very soon after the moment of conception, you can't discount what that, the impact that has on a soul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pierre? There is something I, I don't understand very well. Mm-hmm. Um. Is that about? Is this about the same point? No. No, so that's no. okay. Just hold it because I just want to say one last thing on that point and then we'll move on to yours. So uh, what I wanted to say was about the first part of the paragraph that Sam read out, which was the legitimate duty of earth is to ground the soul in the practical principles of love. Do you remember? It, that's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> like, Wow. A couple of weeks ago, I think, Renee, or maybe a week ago, you asked, like, what is the purpose of this earthly existence? Well, it is about practically understanding what it means to use my will in harmony or disharmony with love, so to ground us in those principles. And when a soul goes to Summerland, they have a different experience of that, different to the one that we're having here about using our will in different different ways and, and having to become sensitive ourselves to the pain that we create in another person rather than it being demonstrated to us immediately. So there's, there's, different, there's different beauties in that. Like, I see a beauty in that. I'm coming to know my soul very well if I have to be sensitive to the fact that if I hurt Alan, at some point I have the opportunity in my earthly life to feel how that felt for him, you know. And that's my free will in action. So I just thought that was a beautiful point to highlight and also to think about in our own lives... How are we assisting other people to ground their earthly existence in understanding the practical principles of love? And I don't mean by giving a book group. I mean by the interactions we have with each other. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, Pierre? Um, It's about a paragraph on page 26 um, of the printout version. Yep. It's... No one can make a simpler or more perfect declaration of it than Jesus. When he said, one is your father, even God, and all ye are brethren. Brethren, yeah. yeah. In the exercise of his paternal duties, God is not a respecter of persons. From every child, obedient love is expected and so this part is just triggering me because yeah. I feel God expects love from me. Yeah. Um, la- like my mom. Yeah. And I, I don't did, understand But did your that mom very... expect love from you, Pierre? Yeah, I feel so. She expected to be loved. Yeah, I think she expected something more than love from you. She wanted an addiction met with you, which is not love, remember. So she wanted you to make her feel like a good woman. That's not love. That's feeding an addiction. So just to make that clari- like a clarifier. But I understand that it's triggering an emotion for you, which is about things being expected of us. Mm. What I feel the, the, um, the paragraph is highlighting is that he's, he's saying that God is not a respecter of persons. I mean, he doesn't play favourites. Everyone's the same in God's eyes. And in order to grow towards God, what, what you need to do is love God and love one another. Um, so that's what I feel it's saying. I think it's great that it's triggering an emotion for you, which is about having things demanded from you as a child. But I, I don't feel God is, like, demanding. But he is expecting that if you want to grow closer to him... You will love him and your brothers and sisters. So, yeah. It's again this little bit of authority thing. You know, we were talking earlier about how authority has been made to, has been used 
over us to make us feel small or less than and all of those kind of things. And in your case, your mother's authority has been to demand things like emotions from you, which has made you feel sad and like you don't have your own sense of self or authority or, or whatever. So that's making you now resistive, similar to Mario, to God actually having an authority. It's actually a different kind of authority. It's a loving authority. And it's, it's one that says, hey, these are the rules, these are the laws, and if you follow them, it's going to be great for everyone. Not just me, not just you, but everyone around you. Um, but because we have this grief inside of us, it's hard for us to feel that. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, it just... Um I'm I'm struggling with the English very much. Yeah, so I feel very, um, hats off to all of you who are reading this in the second language. Uh, mm. Like really, so it, it's it, not even easy English. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of hard to ask questions because I don't know if, if everybody understands and I don't. It just I feel bad about that. Just need to feel that. Yep. Uh, yeah, but it's just from every child obedient love is expected it's the way it's written that's just i'm not yeah. sure i understand but when someone well, asks me obedient love i feel just like is that loving okay so let's it's not different from what i just said but let's look yeah. at the word obedience what does obedience mean it means to obey which is to do what someone asks of you is that, does everyone agree on that? It's Mary's walking dictionary. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, so to, when a request is made to do what, what is asked of you. Now, again, many times in our childhood, we're told we need to be obedient and do what this person who is not very loving, often, sometimes they are, but sometimes they're quite angry or whatever, but in order to love, show we love them, we must obey them. And this is a feeling in a lot of families that also the church has then brought into being because so many people have that feeling in their family. They can accept that, oh, yeah, God must be like that too. I've got to obey him or I should be afraid. And I feel what Eusmos is saying, though, is that he's saying, if you love God, you will want to obey his laws, his laws which say, you know, it's going to, if I love God, if I use my natural love, if I use my will in a loving way, I'm going to grow and it's, the world will be a happier place. He's, God's laws say that, you know. God's laws say that if I'm humble to what comes into my life, I will grow. I will harm people less. So he's saying, yeah, it's obedient love in that way. It's love that honours the laws. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Susan. And then we nearly need to finish, guys. There's so much to say, hey? I just have this feeling that it's a case of like where a poetic word has been used, like expect. Yeah. And, there, and maybe that's really good because it does trigger a lot of feelings in us. Yeah. But I don't even feel like God has an expectation of us or there wouldn't be free will. Mm -hmm. If you look at it I kind agree. of log logic to heart, there's yeah. only one way that the dynamic of a law can work. It's not even that God created it to make it hard or anything. If you just look at life, you know, only love. And oh, I'm going to get lost now, but it's all right. Yeah, I, I can't find an analogy. But if you look at the laws, you can see that unlovingness can't work, and lovingness does work. Yeah. So yeah. it's just perfect. It's just and an is. Exactly. Yeah. And this is like a lot of us stumble around the language because we're like, oh, this sounds a bit churchy, or this sounds a bit like, oh, we're going to be being asked that we're being. A lot of us in this group have a strong feeling that I've been told that God's punishing, and I'm in rebellion against that. You know, and so whenever there's a hint of that in this text, we go, "Hang on, this is I'm a bit concerned. <laughs> what does that really mean?" Isn't um, that awesome, though? Really? Yes, That's why the book I think it's so amazing, fantastic, yeah. because you know what? It shows us where it's a head thing rather than a heart thing. You know, when we read a word and we go, uh, that's triggering some emotion within us. But if we read it from a heart space, we go, huh, no, that just means logically that if I obey God's laws, everything's going to be better. Yeah. And that's what God would want from me, you know, to be closer to him, I would have to obey the laws. And so I feel it's beautiful because it is teasing out these things where we're in our head and not our heart or we're in our heart and we're ignoring reason or we're in our emotions and ignoring reason. And, yeah. and yeah, so I think it's beautiful as well. 
Thanks. When, when you were talking earlier about, you know, like logic and love and, and what I was kind of getting at the same time was it's amazing that we've been set up with these two hard drives <laughs> yeah. and they communicate with each other and then you have your outside guidance as well. So whatever you're focusing on wanting to know and having the curiosity, that whole system, system is just pumping. Yep. And it's teaching you the whole time. It's yep. so amazing. Yep. And the issue, you know, Kate referred to in the beginning about the injuries around the mind and stuff. I think the issue is that we've had this hard drive, the mind leading everything for so long. If we just let the heart lead, the love lead, then the mind is an awesome tool. And, so it, and also we're more sensitive to where the outside input's coming from. Yeah. We just have to get the operating, you know, who's in charge of this operating system? Is it the heart or the head or, you know, the injuries? And so, yeah, beautiful analogy. You said you didn't have one. <laughs> okay, guys, I think that's all we've got time for. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for your inspiration. Ah. <laughs> Thanks, It's fun, hey, this uh, learning about God and growing. Yeah. All right, next week we'll be on book, we'll be on chapter four. Unless anyone has anything burning from chapter three that we, no, we need to move on. It'll take us two years to get through all the books. <laughs>